the needle holder. It has drawers, the arms are called shanks, a ratchet, and rings for fingers. You place your ring finger and thumb in the rings, middle finger at the base of the shank, and index finger along the shank. You can use your little finger as a pivot point for extra stability. You apply opposing pressure on the rings to open and lock the ratchet. The forceps are held in the other hand and can be used to grasp or reflect the skin back in order to see its layers. The needle holder rotates in your hand, your hand going from prone to supine, driving the needle through the skin. You may need to palm the needle holder. The needle holder is held between index and thumb along the shanks, fingers not mounted in the rings. The needle is still driven using a rotatory motion of the wrist. You can then place ring finger, then thumb into the rings in sequence and release the ratchet. The forceps are grasped between thumb and index. You can rest the ulnar border of your hand or use your little finger to provide extra stability. Use the forceps to reflect, not pinch the skin. Scissors are mounted by ring finger and thumb, index extended and you cut with the tip. To use your left hand, index and thumb grasp one ring. The pulp of the middle finger is placed against the other. Opposing force opens the scissors, bringing the rings together Will allow you to cut. The suture has a point, a body, and the swage where the suture attaches. You mount the needle holder two thirds along the body of the needle. You aim to keep the suture at the tip of the needle holder. Enter the skin at 90 degrees. You rotate your hand from palm down to palm up. A supination motion. For wounds that have opposed edges, you can cross to the other side in a single pass. Advance the needle by the body, not the point, or you blunt it, not by the swage, or you fracture the thread off of the needle. Sutures have several sizes. The number refers to the USP, the strength required to break the suture. It will tell you the needle size in millimeters, the needle type, such as reverse cutting, and illustrate a picture. This is a Vicro repeat on a cutting needle. A cutting needle means the sharp edge is on the inside of the curve. Reverse cutting is where the sharp edge is on the outside of the needle. Suture selection is equally as important as the techniques used to close wounds. Sutures can be organized into four groups. Dissolvable, non-dissolvable, monofilament, and braided. Examples of each include PDS, which is a monofilament and dissolvable suture, Vicral Rapide, which is braided and fast dissolving, Vicral, which is braided and dissolving, however, it is longer lasting than Rapide, Nylon, a monofilament, non-dissolvable suture, and Etherbond, a non-dissolvable braided suture. You can mount the needle in the packet two thirds along the body. Keep the needle within the surgical field and pull the packet away. Enter the skin at 90 degrees. The hand rotates from prone to supine. Stabilize the needle with the forceps. Retrieve the needle 
out of the skin with the needle holder. With your left hand, pull the suture through. Wrap the suture around the needle holder twice, pull the short suture through. Repeat this maneuver twice more with a single revolution around the needle holder each time. The end point is the approximation of dermis to dermis, epidermis to epidermis. Now enclose the detail. Enter at 90 degrees, pull the suture through. Lay the needle holder between the long and the short ends of suture. You perform two revolutions around the needle holder. This is a surgeon's knot. Pull the suture through. It's followed by a reef knot, which is a single revolution around the needle holder. The suture ends must alternate in position each time. Surgery should look effortless from the way you hold your forceps to how you pass your suture through the wound edges. When tying your knot, you do not need to apply maximum strength, simply enough force to bring the wound edges together, dermis to dermis, epidermis to epidermis. Hold your forceps so you have control, the needle holder mounted on the pads of your fingers, not at the base, and allow your wrist to rotate following the curve of the needle in its entirety. When you tie a knot, keep the short end around two centimeters long and hold the long end reasonably close to the wound bed. When you place your sutures across a wound, ensure they are evenly spaced at the same distance from the wound edges on both sides and the knots lay on one side of the wound itself. Wrap the suture around the tips of the needle holder and retrieve the short suture by its tip. This prevents getting caught in knots. Removal of sutures is performed by cutting at the base of a single strand of suture flush with the skin. This means when you pull the suture out, no suture that has been facing the elements outside the skin will be dragged through the wound. When performed in this way, you reduce the risk of taking bacteria through the suture tract. If the wound is not fully healed or is under tension such as over a joint, you have the option of removing sutures at different time intervals. Start with a short end toward you and a long end away. Use your left hand to pinch the short thread between index and thumb. Supinate your hand, making the thread run up your palm. Using your right hand, run the long thread down your palm parallel to the short thread. Flex your middle finger over the long thread and push the short thread under it. Squeeze the short thread between middle and ring, release the pinch grip and pull the short thread away from you. Now tighten this knot. Grasp the short end between index and thumb and supinate your hand toward you. Slide your fingers down the thread to grasp it between thumb and ring finger. Run the long suture up the index and middle fingers parallel to the short thread. Flex the middle finger over the long thread and push the short suture under it. Squeezing the short thread between index and middle, pull the short thread towards yourself. Tighten this knot and now we repeat. Grasp the short thread between index and thumb. Turn your palm up. With the short thread running up, run the long thread down your left palm. Flex the middle finger. Squeeze the short thread between middle and ring, release the pincers and pull the short thread away from you. Now run the short thread down your left hand, grasp it between thumb and ring and push your index and middle fingers away, running the long thread up. Flex in the middle finger, squeeze the short thread between index and middle and pull towards you. You need to align the base of the blade to this angle on the scalpel. The key slot of the blade needs to align into the groove of the blade handle. 
Grasping the spine of the blade, advance the blade down the groove of the blade handle until locked in. Hold the knife in one of two positions. For precision, between index and thumb, the handle resting on top of your first web space. You apply control pressure cutting through the skin using the sharp edge of the blade, not just the tip. The power grip can be used for long incisions. The handle is still held between index and thumb, however the entire handle lies beneath your palm. For added control, your little finger can provide support and pivot. You apply distracting force perpendicular to the direction you are cutting. You never cut toward your fingers. Remove the blade by lifting it at the base out of the groove and retract the handle, keeping the blade within your field, but pointing it away from any direction that could cause harm. Excision of a lesion commences with defining its margins. This can be done with small dots along the visible border under bright light. Sometimes you will have to define the lesion palpably. A biopsy margin is 2 mm around the lesion. This can be marked with dashes. Excision commences inferiorly to ensure the blood runs out of the operative field and does not obscure your markings. You define the depth of the excision at one edge. For a biopsy, this is with a cuff of fat. Apply traction on the lesion and sweep the blade from top to bottom in a single sweep, repeating this at the same depth until the lesion is excised. A marker suture is placed when the lesion is excised and not being closed primarily. It is good practice to place this in a consistent location, superior, proximal, cranial, or anterior, depending on the site of excision. You have short acting and long acting. Examples of short acting are lidocaine and xylocaine. Examples of long acting are bupivacaine and chirocaine. We need to be able to calculate the maximum dose of anesthetic. Lidocaine is three milligrams per kilogram, seven milligrams per kilogram, if you add adrenaline. Bupivacaine has a maximum of two milligrams per kilogram due to the cardiotoxicity risk. Anesthetic typically comes as a percentage such as lidocaine 1%, lidocaine 2%. We need to be able to convert this into a volume. To do this, we multiply the percentage by 10 milligrams per mil. Let's take lidocaine 2% and a 70 kilogram female patient. 2% is equivalent to 20 milligrams per mil. If the maximum dose is 3 milligrams per kilogram for lidocaine, the maximum we can give is 210 milligrams total. Therefore, the maximum volume available for use in this patient is 210 over 20 milligrams. This gives us 20.5 and the unit of measurement is mils. We can increase the volume by diluting it in saline. In the first technique, you tie the usual surgeon's knot. That is two revolutions around the needle holder. Maintaining tension on the long suture. Once you retrieve the short suture through the double loop, slide the short thread toward the long thread. 
the knot will remain locked on one side. You follow this with the two usual reef knots. The second option is to do this whilst you tie the second knot, the reef knot. In this technique, tie your surgeon's knot followed by your reef knot, but as you pull the short end through the loop, pull only the short end until the wound is approximated to your desire and then you add tension to the long end till the knot is fully laid down. And finally, you can perform a slip knot, which is useful when your wound reopens after tying your surgeon's knot. In this technique, you tie your surgeon's knot, and the wound may have reopened. You therefore then tie your reef knot, but once you grasp the short end, you pull the short end back to where it came from, the wound will reapproximate. You secure the knot by laying your final reef knot. Let's do this again. You first perform your surgeon's knot. If the wound now reopens, Continue to perform your standard reef knot, but you pull the short thread back to where it came from. Do not pull the long thread until you have the desired approximation, and you complete this by performing one final reef knot. Mattress sutures are useful for wound eversion and closing wounds under a little bit of tension. It starts like an interrupted suture. After you exit opposite the side you started, take a third bite next to the second exit point, finishing next to where you entered. Knots are performed as usual, starting with a surgeon's knot, followed by two reef knots. For the horizontal mattress suture, you tie parallel to the wound. Let's do this again. You take a bite across the wound. You take a third bite next to the second. You then exit next to where you started. Keeping the short end short, try not to let the entire loop dig into the skin before you have tied your knots. And finally, you lay your threads parallel to your wound when tying on knots, ensuring to continue to lay them square, alternating their position. The locking horizontal mattress is almost the same as the horizontal mattress but it's more useful for wounds that are under tension. For these wounds, start in the apices where there is less tension. You take a bite across the wound. The third bite is next to the second, and you exit next to where you started. Before pulling the loop flush with the skin and tying the knot, pass the needle and the long end of thread through the loop on the opposite side. You complete your wound closure with your surgeon's knot and your two reef knots. The process is repeated in the opposite apex. 
enter on one side of the wound and exit on the other. Your third bite is adjacent to your second point. You exit adjacent to the first point. Reduce the size of your loop and keep your short end short. Pass the suture and the long thread through the loop. You tie your surgeon's knot, followed by two reef knots. The vertical mattress. You start in the standard fashion, exiting opposite where you start. In this case, your third bite is placed in front of your second exit point. And you exit in front of your first bite of where you started. You perform your surgeon's knot, followed by two reef knots, ensuring that you alternate the position of the suture ends after each throw. And again, you enter on one side of the wound and exit opposite on the other. You take a third bite which is in front of the second exit point. The exit point is in front of where you first started. Your surgeon's knot is two revolutions around the needle holder, and this is followed by a reef knot, which is a single revolution around the needle holder. You perform two of these. The half-buried suture starts like an interrupted with an entry point. On the opposite side, however, you take a horizontal bite under the epidermis within the dermis. The suture should not be visible. You finish by going from inside to out, exiting adjacent to where you started, like the final bite of a mattress suture. Tie your knots to get approximation of the skin, dermis to dermis, epidermis to epidermis. You perform your standard surgeon's knot followed by two reef knots for wound closure. And again, you start as normal from outside to in. You take a transverse bite within the dermis. You do not want to see this suture in the epidermis from on top. You take the final bite exiting adjacent to the first, as with the final bite of a mattress suture. This is followed by your surgeon's knot, your reef knot, and another reef knot to secure your wound closure. The pull through subcuticular starts by taking a bite from the outside of the apex to inside the wound. You then take small transverse bites through the dermis in an alternating fashion on each side of the wound. Typically, the exit point on one side is the starting point on the other. At the start and the end of the wound, to ensure good approximation of the apices, it is helpful to take smaller bites 
as you progress down the length of the wound, your bite can extend by a millimetre or so. You need to ensure that you are at the same depth of the wound on both sides. The depth is at the dermal epidermal junction. You do not stitch fat and you do not want to see the suture or thread come through the epidermis. Ensure you follow the curve of the needle when passing the suture through the skin. Obtain enough bite of the tissue so that the suture doesn't cheese wire through the skin. And finally, try and mount the needle early on the needle holder and minimize overhandling of the needle between bites through the skin. You exit through the apex. At this point, you can pull both ends of the suture until the wound closes. For a pull through suture, you use a monofilament suture that you can simply pull out once the wound has healed. The buried subcuticula starts by anchoring the suture. On one side of the wound, pass the suture from deep to superficial and tie your knots in the usual fashion. A surgeon's knot followed by two reef knots. You then proceed down the wound in the dermal layer horizontally in the dermal epidermal junction. The exit point on one side is the start on the opposite. As you exit the skin, use your forceps to give you counter traction to reveal the body of the suture. As you go down the wound, mount the needle early within the needle holder. Ensure to follow the curve of the needle as you pass through the tissues to ensure you've got a good bite. Ensure to use your forceps to give you good counter traction. Your final pass finishes by creating a loop of suture instead of exiting at the apex. You can now perform an Aberdeen knot. The loop is maintained over your right index finger and thumb on the left, the needle stays on the right. With your left index finger, hook the body of the short thread on the right through the loop with your index finger. Keeping the needle on the right hand side, pull the thread it's attached to through the loop from the bottom upwards. You will see the knot fastening down. For a monofilament, you repeat this process four to six times. After the final knot, you also pass the suture through the loop. And finally, you take a bite inside the apex, pulling the suture. This will bury the knot inside the wound. Deep dermal sutures remove tension and obliterate dead space. It is often easiest to start in the apices. You proceed from deep to superficial, on one side, and superficial to deep on the opposite side.
as with all wound closure, you tie the usual knots. However, in this instance, you tie them in parallel to the wound itself. That is, a surgeon's knot followed by two reef knots with the short thread and long thread alternating in position. You cut the suture ends flush with the skin so the suture ends cannot be seen above the skin. Typically, a deep dermal suture uses a dissolvable suture and to obtain a better grasp within the tissues, it can be helpful to pass the needle obliquely as opposed to vertically through the dermis. You pass from deep to superficial on the side closest to you. You pronate the needle and go from superficial to deep on the side furthest away from you. and you tie your knots in parallel to the wound. Pass from deep to superficial. Mount the suture early. Pronate the needle. and pass from superficial to deep on the opposite side. Tie your knots parallel to the wound, alternating the lie of the suture ends, laying secure knots, square knots, each time. Cut flush with the skin. And now you have obliterated the dead space and reduced the tension. For this linear wound, you can perform a range of superficial wound closure techniques. We have opted for a continuous suture. This starts like an interrupted stitch. Once your knots are formed, Cut only the short end a few millimetres in length and you can now run the suture down the wound evenly spaced. You take even bites across the wound in a straight line. Ensure to mount the needle early when you get to the end of the wound, maintain a short loop of suture at the opposite side to the long thread with the needle still attached. Perform your surgeon's knot, grasping the tip of the loop with the needle holder, like a short end of suture, and bring it through the loop. This is followed by two reef knots. And 